and we uh, are excited that she was able to provide that to us. We have another very special uh, visitor that I want to uh, take just a moment and introduce to you guys. Um, his name is Mr. Sunil Radia, and I know um, Sunil is on the line. I saw him log in. Just a little bit of background on Sunil uh, for you guys to understand who is visiting with you guys today. Uh, Sunil is a Stan Richards School grad before we were called Stan Richards School. He's part of the spring 1999 Texas media cohort. Um, and you know, we've always taught you guys that you can be both very creative and both uh, analytical at the same time. Sunil is the perfect example of that. He started his career as a media associate at Starcom and then he elevated himself in the creative space to become a VP creative director at Danu and Leo Burnett. Um, so bridged that gap completely. Um, he became head of the uh, BBH labs and director of innovation there. He's been an, an EVP for product innovation at VivaKey, another very major publicist organization. He was ultimately the founder and president of Finch 15, uh, an executive director at an organization called Greatest Good that I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, leadership uh, positions at Urban and the US and Gunslinger Studios. He's a board member of four A's and um, in 2016, uh, 2016, he moved to RGA where he's taken on the role of Global Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, three fun things for me to tell you quickly about Sunil. I didn't tell him I was going to share these with you, but some fun things to know about him. Um, I know Sunil to be a very devoted husband and father. In fact, his equally amazing wife, Whitney, and Sunil were on our uh, national student and comp ad competition team or NSEC team at UT, um, and I got to mentor them on that project. Uh, for the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if Sunil, you remember that. Um, a second thing I wanna tell you guys about Sunil is that um, he's a very first, uh, he is the very first of literally hundreds of MAPE letters that I've written over the years. I don't know if he knows that, but- I didn't know I'm that. Very, very first, and what a pleasure uh, to have that. And then my last thing to share with you guys, if you look in the bottom corner here, you can see our, our cohort, you can see Sunil right there in the center of things where he always belongs. Um, one thing you can't see in this photo that I wish you could because I did and I've seen it many times since and I know it is his signature and that no matter how dressed he up he is for a presentation to Neil, uh, his signature movement or signature fa um, fashion statement is his white tennis shoes. So I bet if I could talk to you right now or see right now, he's probably, oh, there we go. He's wearing his tennis. So to Neil, without further ado, I would love to uh, give you the mic. Great, thank you so much. Uh, no, I didn't know you were gonna do that. Um, so I, I very much appreciate it. Um, I am just gonna shift my view here a little bit. Can you guys hear me okay? Some thumbs up maybe? Yeah, perfect, okay, great, thank you guys. Um, okay, so you know, when I was thinking about this, I had to ask myself, can you imagine graduating into an economy that's crashing from going from a market that felt like we're moving into a new era of innovation and consumer experiences and media only to see it crash down just months before graduation? all while you sit holding a degree in an industry that may not recover. I mean, advertising, it's gotta seem so relevant at a time like that, right? Uh, oh yeah, I know. But if it makes you feel better, I know what that feels like too. The peak of the dot-com bubble was March, 2000, and I graduated 60 days later, just as it was becoming clear that things were starting to change. But maybe they won't change that much. Maybe it's just a blip. I mean, who needs business models to make money? Shout out Cosmo.com for delivering my BlackBerry my first week of work within an hour from any store I chose for free. Oh shit, things are gonna change, aren't they? Yep, the dot-com bubble was an illusion. And obviously so. It turns out you can't just put off having a functioning business on the company to-do list. Of course that's an illusion. But it was a pretty easy one to buy because we were so incentivized to buy it. It was easier not to deal with the problems it raised and to just take the new jobs and insane perks. I mean, what Austin grad doesn't love a free Razor scooter? Mm -hmm. In short, it was easier to put off the inevitable. And this, my friends, is the big difference between the bad situation I graduated into and the one you guys are graduating into. Our class was so much more naive. There was a fiction we could buy. You, well, you have reality exposed, staring directly at you. Sure, reality is wearing a mask on his face, but you know from his eyebrows, he's dead serious. He's gonna make this hard. You can't avoid reality. 
You can't become a millionaire on paper just for taking a job at a company with a funny name that happens to end in .com and pretend he isn't coming to end your party. In your case, reality has arrived already. And unfortunately, he sucks at social distancing. My class, oh, we lived in a bubble. A bubble where we could believe the grown-ups knew what they were doing. We just had to listen to them and work hard and get our piece of the infinitely growing pie. In fact, if I'm honest with you, we kind of knew we were living in a bubble. It was just so convenient. When my class represented as the University of Texas in the National Student Advertising Competition, as Lisa pointed out, ironically, we even leveraged that insight. Uh, it actually wasn't the Wall Street Journal, Lisa, it was the New York Times, and we had to do a full creative and media campaign for them. And they asked us to target college students like us. And do you know what our tagline was for that? It was, expect the world, it's right outside your bubble. Yeah, that's how obvious it was. But like so many people do, we try to live in the illusion that we knew was an illusion. And in what I would call an incredible act of self-hypnosis, we somehow try to use it as a resume builder by winning a competition inside that very bubble. Turns out that didn't work either. We finished fourth in that competition, which was low by UT's high standards at the time, which we're reminded of often. Uh, Dr. Murphy, you know, an icon of the Texas advertising program, was so mad about it, he literally abandoned the school's first, fourth place trophy in Las Vegas, where the finals took place. And uh, honestly, I don't know if he knows this, but I actually grabbed it. It's safely preserved right now in this Brooklyn home. That's not a joke. I have that trophy. I took it. So you don't have any illusions about what's ahead, but that doesn't mean you can see the path very clearly. The future's ambiguous, and it's ambiguous globally. Media, marketing, honestly, I'd say any profession at this point. And this is where your story has its greatest potential. You see, the one thing I do know for certain is the resilience and resolve of a class graduating from this school. Not only do Lisa Tobias and the rest of the faculty joining you today give you the business skills you need to succeed in the marketing industry, but kind of sneakily along the way, they teach you how to be adaptable professionals and leaders too. Or maybe more accurately put, they force you to figure it out. And you did, or you wouldn't be here today. I know this because it turns out that I was very ready to embrace change and ambiguity when I graduated. And that really surprised me. I grew up in Texas. I knew I wanted to work in advertising as early as 15, 16 years old, thanks to brands like Nike that I loved. And I went to this wonderful school only an hour drive from the house I grew up in. It's kind of the opposite of an approach some, uh, for someone who embraces change, right? I had a straight line plan when I enrolled in Texas media. Graduate, live in a nice house, probably with a pool somewhere in like Barton Springs or something. And one day I'll become an exec at gsd &M. Then I took an internship at Starcom in Chicago, as Lisa pointed out, and that changed my perspective. I got a sense of the world outside of the bubble I lived in. I realized I had a lot of interests I hadn't even been exposed to yet. And it was enough of a taste to decide to go live in Chicago after graduation, you know, just for a couple of years. Then I'll get back to that plan with the Barton Springs house. And that was the beginning of my discovery process. I realized I hadn't embraced change before because to be totally honest with you guys, I was scared of it. I was a planner. I like to know exactly what I was doing. The idea of taking a step and not knowing the next step, well, that scared the longhorn poop out of me. But next thing I knew, I'd done it. And then I did it again and again. You know, maybe I wanted to be a creative. Wait, no, I'm a strategist. LA sounds cool. Should I start my own company? You know, this innovation thing seems like an interesting field. Cut to 18 years later, and along the way, I won some honors and recognitions. But one in particular that really meant a lot to me was being inducted into the Advertising Hall of Achievement. Industry icons attended, and somehow they were listening to me, and they clapped. They knew my work. Some even flew in to celebrate my induction. And just so you guys understand, this is like the type of person I would normally come into the industry looking up to, and I would be thrilled just to have them say hello to me. So it was incredible to have them bend their schedules around celebrating my contributions to their industry. And now it was our industry. Like, was this really happening? And here's the kicker. I had barely touched any advertising in years. I didn't do any of the stuff that they did. I certainly hadn't done any media work in a long time. 
at least not the way it was defined in this very program, it turns out that my class wasn't the only one facing change, even though it felt like it at the time. The whole industry was. We were graduating into unprecedented reality. But that's actually the best place to be when things are unprecedented. Everyone else is halfway through a plan, and they need a fresh set of eyes to help them navigate this new reality. The advertising business was being turned upside down when I graduated, and going along on that journey was something I embraced. Today, I have a job that didn't exist when I graduated. I run innovation at a company that knows something about resilience, RGA. And for those familiar with RGA, you're probably not surprised, because of course, Nike is a famous client. You knew I'd end up there. But think about this, the company is my age. It started as a special effects studio when I was born. And now, today, we compete with management consultancies, tech consultancies, brand consultancies. We help huge clients do new things. They value the fact that we know a lot about technology, design, marketing, as they deal with change. And somehow, that's my job there. It turns out that all those industries, they all got smashed together and no company could keep up alone. So they found the people most ready to change and learn new things. The companies that get that talent, that the ones that embrace the change and then empower those people, they perform best, period. And those people they look to, the ones that embrace the change, well, Many of them were the icons I looked up to. And the group of them that I talked about that was clapping that day, they were clapping celebrating me as a change agent. That's how it became our industry, not just theirs. And somehow that industry is even better than the one that existed before the dot-com crash. You see, the whole world changes, like all the time. William Gibson very famously said, the future's already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. But when you consider that alongside Thomas Friedman's simple reminder about globalization, that the world is flat, you can see your map more clearly, even as it evolves right in front of you. Move to the parts where the change tickles your curiosity, even if it feels far away. Change is your opportunity. I'd encourage you to take the job that scares you most. Can't get a job? Take the time off. Learn about a new thing that's vaguely interesting. You can get a job, but it's not the one you want because of the economy. Let them pay you while you learn something new. Seriously, don't dabble, dive. You're the only one holding yourself back from embracing change. And you know, when I graduated, there was a, a consistent bit of advice we got. People would often tell us not to measure our success by other people's expectations. And honestly, it's great advice. And I needed it sometimes. But what I wish someone had said to me was not to measure my success by my own expectations because those expectations change. They change because the world changes. And if you're willing to work hard enough and take some risks, you'll find the two line up all the time. The intersection point may not be along that straight line you mapped out at first, but you know, you do that often enough and you realize something. When your hair goes gray like this, you'll know the following. There is no line. Change is permanent and inevitable. The pace of it, that's all that changes. And it's always in the same direction. So embrace it, even when the future is completely unknown. Resisting change, well, that doesn't change it. You're just resisting reality. And we already know he wins most of the time. Pour one out for the original pets.com. I'm so glad that I not only learned to accept change, but that I passionately embraced it. And as Lisa mentioned, I'm really glad a classmate of mine did too. She graduated and went to go work in San Francisco, you know, at FCB just for a couple of years before she moved back to Austin and follow her little straight line. As Lisa pointed out, she also was on the national student advertising competition team. And she was the one I rescued that dumb fourth place trophy with me, even though first place was the destination we set out for together. She's the CEO of a talent company now. In fact, she's also in this Brooklyn apartment with that trophy. We just celebrated 15 years of marriage together here while in quarantine. And it was perfect. And it was, unprecedented. Mm -hmm. It's not at all how either of us mapped it out. And thank God, because otherwise, we wouldn't have found the terrain that we now call home. You see, it wasn't on any of the maps we made that back then. I want to congratulate you guys, class of 2020. I'm excited to see what you do. I hope you embrace the change. And thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yay!
Neil, fantastic. It was so great to see you, have you here with us on this important day and share your story. So um, we wish you all the best in quarantine. Stay safe in New York and um, Brooklyn. And um, thank you again um, for being here. I know it means a ton to the students. So Of course, thank you guys. I'm gonna hang out a little bit and see uh, a little bit more of the ceremony before I drop. So thank Absolutely. you guys. Absolutely. All right.